your time. I'm Harris Faulkner. Here's Dana. We begin with a Fox News alert, an incredible scene at the White House today as President Trump allowed the cameras to roll for 45 minutes as he hosted a bipartisan group of lawmakers for a meeting on immigration reform. Hello, everyone. I'm Dana Perino, and this is The Daily Briefing. We got a behind-the-scenes look as the 22 lawmakers were openly negotiating a fix to DACA and the need for more border security. President Trump insisting both sides need to work together on a bill. Listen. I feel having the Democrats in with us is absolutely vital because this should be a bipartisan bill. This should be a bill of love. Truly, it should be a bill of love, and we can do that. Chief White House correspondent John Roberts joins us now. So, John... Uh, that was a fascinating meeting. Um, having worked at the White House, I know that it would have been great for my purposes as a press secretary for someone <laughs> to have seen what it was like inside those rooms. We actually got a chance to do that today. Do you think that this makes it more likely that a bipartisan solution is possible? Well, you know, I don't know about that, Dana, but, but I will say I was about to say to you, why didn't you do this when you were press <laughs> secretary? I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall in some mm -hmm. of those meetings. I mean, what we saw today was absolutely extraordinary and something that I have never seen before. Now, the, the press pool was not in for the entire meeting. I was just talking with Congresswoman Martha McSally, who said that it went on for about a half an hour after the press pool left. But they were there for a full 45 minutes in and, and what initially had turned into some sort of you know, formal remarks uh, where people knew the camera was on uh, into a real discussion of the issues at hand. And I think it, it really changed a lot, too, when Lindsey Graham piped up and said that, you know, uh, we're going to get the crap uh, beaten out of us directly quoting him uh, for a lot of these things uh, in the Senate, and he knows well that as being part of the Gang of Eight when they tried to do comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, but the president was insistent that, that he wants to get DACA done, wants it to be a bill of love, thinks that there should be bipartisan support, but at the same time as he does DACA, he also wants to get some of his agenda items out there, including the wall, including an end to chain migration, and an end to the lottery. Listen to what the president said when, when he was asked by, uh, by Lindsey Graham, uh, whether or not that he would be willing to support whatever comes out of the House and Senate. Listen here. If we do the right bill here, we are not very far away. You know, we've done most of it. If you want to know the truth, Nick, if we do this properly, DACA, you're not so far away from comprehensive immigration reform. And if you want to take it that further step, I'll take the heat. I don't care. I don't care. I'll take all the heat you want to give me. And I'll take the heat off both the Democrats and the Republicans. My whole life has been heat. <laughs> I like heat in a certain way. So that was prompted by uh, Lindsey Graham and uh, the discussion moving in the direction of, well, let's do DACA, but let's also do comprehensive immigration reform, which, uh, as I alluded to, as a member of the Gang of Eight, Lindsey Graham, Marco Rubio, other uh, members of the Senate uh, really got severely uh, knocked around for their views and the, many of the Republicans were branded as rhinos and it took them a long time to come back from that which is why during the presidential campaign Marco Rubio basically left that whole idea behind but then as it got into this idea of whether or not you do a fix for the so-called dreamers DACA versus comprehensive immigration reform Diane Feinstein posited well let's do a clean DACA bill which means just fix the dreamers and then we can do things like border security later the president initially seemed to buy into that, but then when Kevin McCarthy jumped in and said, well, wait a second here, basically saying to the president, she's laying a trap for you, don't fall for it. He said, we have to do DACA and some of these border security issues, and then we can do comprehensive immigration reform. The president clarified it near the end of the meeting when he was asked by ABC correspondent Jonathan Carl whether there could be a DACA agreement without an agreement to build a border wall. Listen to his response here. Is there any agreement without the wall? Uh, no, there wouldn't be. So the wall has to be there. Has to, you need it. John, you need the wall. I mean, it's, it's wonderful. I'd love not to build the wall, but you need the wall. And I will tell you this, the ICE officers and the Border Patrol agents, I had them just recently up. They say if you don't have the wall, you know, in certain areas, obviously, that aren't protected by nature, if you don't have the wall, you cannot have security. You just can't have it. It doesn't work. So eventually where the discussion seemed to end up was that the president is on board for doing a DACA fix 
with some border security arrangements mm -hmm. and then start the process of comprehensive immigration reform soon after that. Uh, what some of the lawmakers who came out, uh, Dana, you know, were asked, well, with the television cameras rolling, how was the meeting? They said they thought it was one of the most productive meetings that they've ever had. Congresswoman Martha McSally told me once the cameras left, the language did get a little more frank as people <laughs> were laying out their positions as to what could and couldn't be in any kind of a bill. But, uh, you know, all around, it seems a thumbs up from everybody in the room there that this might have been a made for television moment at the beginning, but then actually became something uh, that got some work done and uh, may have brought the two sides closer together. We'll see. It's amazing. All right, John Roberts, thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you. it. For more on this, we bring in the anchor of Special Report, Brett Baer. It was uh, certainly fascinating, and it might have just been the thing that President Trump needed to show, not tell, um, how he's got a handle on things. And if you look at the meeting, not only is he presiding over it, but he's commenting on it. And then everybody in the room didn't expect cameras to be there, but they had to know what they were talking about in order to have a constructive conversation today. Yeah, it was fascinating. You and I both remarked on Twitter how uh, this open exchange on policy specifics and the president was was definitely orchestrating that meeting and talking about the specifics. I will say the one part where Senator Feinstein says DACA only uh, bill uh, clean. Uh, I think the president probably in his mind, I'm guessing, was saying the DACA bill that they were talking about, which is border security mm -hmm. and DACA. Uh, so you I think you give him a, the benefit of the doubt on right. that sentence. But overall, it was fascinating. In the wake of all of the days that we have just seen, of all of the coverage of this book, uh, to, to have that openness yeah. in behind the scenes, I mean, you know this better than anybody, was really rare. Often, if we ever had you all in um, in an off the record situation where the president would just able to talk, you'd leave and you'd say, "Why can't you just put that on the record and on camera?" And then everybody would have a different perspective about President Bush, and that might be true for President Obama, uh, President Trump. Who knows? But take a listen to what he said at the beginning when he said the press could stay a while. Maybe uh, the press can stay for a little while, and a couple of folks can make statements. And I don't mind the statements. We want to have this as a very open forum. I will say, though, that uh, I really do believe Democrat and Republican, the people sitting around this table, want to get something done in good faith. And I think we're on our way to do it. So presidents have the power to convene. Certainly, it was one of the best things that they have in their toolkit. But also, if you look at all polls, they say that most people want Republicans and Democrats to work together, to get along, to get something done. Usually, that doesn't actually happen in Washington, D.C. But this might give a chance for both Republicans and Democrats who are in that meeting to leave and get good press back in their home districts for that very thing. Definitely. And and this is, I think, what you're going to see from this White House setting up towards the midterms. And that is not the traditional stir up the base as much, do some of that, but really try to portray working across party lines to get something done in a bipartisan fashion. You saw him mention not only the immigration things, but also infrastructure a couple of times that he thinks uh, Democrats can sign on to. I will say it's going to be, as you know very well, mm. on immigration, an uphill battle yeah, it's like with Lucy immigration with conservatives. Ann Coulter just mm -hmm. tweeting out, nothing Michael Wolf could say about at real Donald Trump mm -hmm. has hurt him as much as the DACA love fest right now. Uh, uh, so you are going to hear and see that, I think, Dana, over the next few and, hours. And yet, uh, Brett, I wanted to talk about this. Look at these um, quotes today from the USA Today front page above the fold story from Republican uh, sort of right wing conservative group members saying that. Uh, for example, uh, the Center for Immigration Studies saying rip off the Band-Aid and give them a green card in regards to the Dreamers. A leader of Numbers USA, known as the great anti-amnesty organization, that we're open to it. And the Federation for American Immigration Reform says members of Congress would not face major backlash from the group's supporters. And I think that's why Lindsey Graham said this. Take a listen. I think what we can do is do what the American people want us to do. 62% of the Trump voters support a pathway to citizenship for the DACA kids if you have strong borders. You have created a opportunity here, Mr. President, and you need to close the deal. So I think that's what the president was saying. He says, I'll take the heat for it. He's trying to tell those members, just go ahead and let's try to get this done. And he thinks that the conservatives or his base are going to stick with him. 
Right. And I, I think that's going to be a fascinating part of this story, really the part of the story, if the president can do that. Uh, he's saying he can take the heat and, more importantly, he will sign what Congress puts on his desk. In other words, even if he doesn't like it or doesn't agree with all of it, he will sign it because he said in that room, I trust the leaders on both sides of the aisle to move forward with something comprehensive. After yeah. that, Dana, I think it's going to be tough for some Democrats to make the 25th Amendment uh, yeah. pitch. The fact that he's anyway. mentally deficient or mm -hmm. incapacitated. We haven't seen that from the past three presidents in an open forum with congressional bipartisan leaders, let right. alone know this one well you, and well here's the other thing that I think that happens politically so you have Bannon now basically severed from President Trump he had said he was going to try to primary all these uh, Senate Republican incumbents but you had President Trump at Camp David saying I plan to support the incumbents who are running and if the immigration deal is what President Trump says it is now, which is basically some uh, one of love, as he says, hearkening back to something from the campaign that we don't have to get into. But basically, I think that that makes the politics for Republicans, and if you're Mitch McConnell, much easier than trying to fight lots of different battles, because a lot of that was going to be based on immigration. If you are in the so-called establishment Republican Party up on Capitol Hill, this has been a great stretch yep. for you. Steve Bannon has lost all power. He is, in the eyes of the president and the administration, persona non grata. He is not the primary challenge around the country that Mitch McConnell once feared, perhaps. And the president is negotiating on things that you think you can negotiate on, big things. Mm -hmm. And that potentially is a big deal for the GOP. In the past 30 minutes, with this talk about an immigra immigration deal, also it was announced that the president's going to Davos. <laughs> Do you think Steve Bannon has any influence inside the White House? Now? Also, can you imagine the Davos crowd right now, like whispering and texting each other? Like, what is this going to be like? I, I would love to be a fly on the wall for that meeting. That would definitely be interesting. Oh, and then you mentioned earmarks. Oh, right. I mean, yeah. this, I mean the swamp is, is alive says, and well, I guess. Or yeah, something. nothing says drain the swamp like bringing back earmarks. But. I do think he has a very good point. And later on yeah. in the program, we have Matt Schlapp and Michael Meehan here to talk about that as well. So, Brett Baer, I could not think of a better guest to have on today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dan. So more on that extraordinary moment at the White House today. Well, you should do it. And I'm there with you because this system, this system really lends itself to not getting along. It lends itself to hostility and anger. And they hate the Republicans and they hate the Democrats. President Trump restores the natural balance so your eyes will thank you. More than eye drops, dry eye therapy. There are tears. Fox News Channel on Sirius XM, your favorite shows on Channel 114. Plus, every story, every 15 minutes. Fox News Headlines 24-7, Channel 115. Normally, you wouldn't have a president coming to this meeting. Normally, frankly, you'd have Democrats, Republicans, and maybe nothing would get done. Uh, you know, our system lends itself to not getting things done. And I, I hear so much about earmarks, the old earmark system, how there was a great friendliness when you had earmarks. But, of course, they had other problems with earmarks. But maybe all of you should start thinking about going back to a form of earmarks, because this system... <laughs> President Trump bringing back the idea of earmarks at a bipartisan meeting of House and Senate leaders. Michael Meehan, president and CEO of Squared Communications and a former chief of staff for Washington Senator Maria Cantwell. Matt Schlapp is chairman of the American Conservative Union. Great to have you both here. Let me read to you what uh, Senator Claire McCaskill tweeted after this meeting. She said, huh? The president just embraced earmarks? Talk about the swampiest of swamp creatures. you got to be kidding me. She probably, Matt, is thinking about the old bridge to nowhere and how, you know, that really fueled a lot of frustration in the country and I think really fed into the Tea Party. Um, what do you think of this idea, though, that is there some merit to having some way to sort of get these deals done? Uh, yeah, I'm lukewarm at best, but I, I do think it's interesting that Claire McCaskill uh, chose to criticize uh, the president because I thought that was the most extraordinary video I have seen coming out of the White House. I think in the whole time I've been in politics, it was like the American people got to see uh, how a meeting goes. And they got to see that's the Donald Trump, for those of us who dealt with him even before he was president, 
They got to see a little bit of how he talks and mm -hmm. runs a meeting, and uh, it's different than what most presidents would do. But when you're a part of that, it's very engaging because he listens, he's quick to respond, and you really you get his attention. And I have a feeling that this is going to spur other Democrats who are smarter to say, hey, I am going to work with the president on certain things. I don't think, I think that most presidents do, con I think most people and leaders conduct meetings like this. I think the difference is, Michael, that he actually opened the doors and let the press be in there yes. for 45 minutes and actually maybe even help Democrats get basically some of what they wanted, which is a push to do DACA. Um, and perhaps maybe that will include some security, but they got some reassurance that that's going to get done. Right. And clearly, um, it, it sounded like he's willing to separate out, you know, the immediate need for the 800,000 with the March 5th deadline looming and then put some of the bigger, tougher issues up to, to be dealt with later. And it sounds like progress to me. And so the proof will be in the pudding. But it was sort of a fascinating um, opportunity because you really haven't seen this with this president yet to put people around the table and listen to both sides and sort of see if you he can was the deal maker, deal. right? Like yeah, that was part of the, the part of the appeal for during the campaign for people that voted for him is that he would be able to bring people together. Together, that he, Matt, he's not necessarily that ideological. And I have to say that some of the things he was saying um, about immigration and the way he was talking sounded like what, you know, somebody like a Jeb Bush or a Marco Rubio would have said. And any Republicans that sort of backed that up during the campaign were viciously ridiculed by people uh, in the Trump campaign and uh, in the media. But now that the president seems to be embracing that, do you think that maybe comprehensive immigration reform could get done? Yeah, except I think the one piece that we're missing here, and it came through in the meeting over and over again, is the idea the president has been very aggressive on getting rid of this uh, diversity lottery system. He's very aggressive on cracking down on immigration from certain countries that mm. seem to breed terrorism, which we didn't hear much from the other candidates who ran for president who were more open to immigration. And obviously, he hates the concept of chain migration because he goes through all of the terrorists and the terrorist instances where Americans have been harmed because mm -hmm. of chain migration. So mm -hmm. uh, he's actually pretty uh, tough uh, on those types of questions mm -hmm. and the wall, which uh, I think is unique, unique for him. But I think I don't know if we're going to get to a deal here, uh, Dana. I I'm not sure we're going to get to a deal on the spending bill. But I do think we could get to a deal moving forward early in the year on getting on really changing the way we do immigration in this country, securing our southern border, and also giving the Democrats maybe a few things they want. All right. Well, could you stick around, Michael and Matt, because I want to ask you about Arizona Sheriff Joe Arpaio setting his sights on the U.S. Senate and other 2018 news, plus the White House press briefing about to get started. We'll take you there as soon as it begins. Your beautiful kitchen, all in less than three days, at a fraction of the cost of replacing cabinets. Go to ExpressReface.com, enter the amount of doors and drawers in your kitchen, then get your instant self-serve quote. ExpressReface.com, the smart way to modernize your kitchen. Change. Former Arizona Sheriff Joe Arpaio pulling the trigger, announcing plans to run for the U.S. Senate. Arpaio is an early supporter of President Trump, telling the Washington Examiner, I would not be doing this if I thought that I could not win. I'm not here to get my name in the paper. I get that every day. Anyway, Michael Meehan and Matt Schlapp are back with me. Matt, he also wouldn't be able to do that if he hadn't been given a pardon by President Trump uh, early last year or in the middle of last year. And this Republican primary is getting pretty crowded. You already have Kelly Ward, who was initially backed by Steve Bannon in right. the race. It's expected that Martha McSally, the House representative who was just there with the president in the cabinet room, um, she is apparently going to announce her run for that same seat. And now Arpaio getting into the race. Is that a dangerous for Republicans in Arizona? You know, Dana, I, I'm, I don't believe that there can be too much, uh, you know, we get a little clinical uh, in some of these primaries and we worry so much about having a big raucous primary. I think sometimes they actually are helpful. In this case, there's nothing the Republicans can do. There's going to be a lot of candidates. I think we're going to have more candidates enter the race. I actually would think that this development would probably help McSally a little bit because mm. it seems like a lot of conservatives are going to be split amongst more than one candidate. Um, Michael, do you think that this is a realistic pickup for Democrats? And last year, Hillary Clinton's team put a lot of uh, resources into Arizona. President Trump won it by four points. But you have a state senator, um, uh, State Senator Simina, I believe. Do you think she's got a shot? 
Yeah, I thought Congresswoman Cinema. Yeah, she That's actually right. does have a, a shot, and I, and I do think that her chances improved uh, this morning with this announcement. Um, I'll let Matt handicap the Republican side, but but Donald Trump won Arizona by four points. Uh, uh, the sheriff lost his sheriff's race in a very hard, a Republican county, Maricopa, mm -hmm. and I just think that it, that it's probably not the best platform to go make a statewide run from. And I think we have a very good candidate. She's raised a lot of money. She's very good on the stump, uh, and I've become the. Well, and our optimistic. gives her a little more to talk about out there on the stump, I would imagine. She sure does. And things that you normally don't get to talk about, like presidential pardons. You know? And just because I want you to have a little bit of fun today, <laughs> I'm going to show you a uh, play for you a soundbite from President Trump talking about a possible challenger to him in 2020. Just now he said this. Watch. Oprah would be a lot of fun. I know her very well. You know, I did one of her last shows. She had Donald Trump, this is before politics, her last week. And she had Donald Trump, and my family was very nice. No, I like Oprah. I don't think she's going to run. I don't think she's going to run. I know her very well. Michael, I'll let you take the first whack at that. What do you think about all the Democrat hysteria around a possible Oprah run? Look, it's been a long year for Democrats, so clearly anybody who's as popular as Oprah Winfrey, a billionaire, she runs her own TV network, she, she's, you know, she, she ma matches Donald Trump. But the truth is, Americans usually pick the opposite of the previous president, so I'm not so sure how she would match up in a, in a, in a general election against Donald Trump. And I don't think she would actually want to run. I mean, I think one of the first things, Matt, that the Democrats would ask Oprah is, are you willing to release your tax returns? And I have a <laughs> feeling the answer would be no. Yeah, let's face it, running for president seems very uh, enticing to a lot of very famous people, but the actual process of doing it, look what happened to Hillary Clinton, uh, it really shows oh, your weaknesses, and sometimes you take someone who's outside of politics, like an Oprah Winfrey, you th throw her through a campaign, something she's never done before, my guess is she'll be greatly diminished if she tries to do it, and that might cause her not to do it in the first place. Well, I guess you can't blame Democrats for having a little fun this week, Michael. No. You, you're right. You've had a tough year. But we love having you on the program. Michael Meehan and Matt Schlapp, thanks for being here today. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. As we await the White House. Your money is being put to really, really good use. The people that take the time to donate, they're heroes to us. The fact that they're willing to give means the world. Thank you. You've changed my life. I agree with Tom Cotton that the American public are very frustrated with us. One of the reasons they're frustrated with us because we continue to couple things on which uh, we have large agreement with things on which we do not agree. This is a perfect example of that. That was House Minority Whip Steny Hoyer talking immigration at that extraordinary bipartisan White House meeting. Let's bring in New Jersey Democratic Congressman Josh Gottheimer. He's a member of the Financial Services Committee and a co-chair of the Problem Solvers Caucus. Talk about problem solving. Did you like that uh, little open meeting today? I, mean, I think that's the step in the right direction. I haven't, I didn't get a chance to watch the whole thing, Dana, and Happy New Year. Um, but I'll, but I'll tell you right now, we need to come together around tables like that to actually dig into these problems, mm -hmm. and whether it's infrastructure or making sure we get the Dreamers, uh, uh, to make sure they don't get thrown out of the country. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, these are the right steps we've got to do is talk to each other. I want, I brought you on to talk about your idea for tax reform. Let me play for you what President Trump said about taxes, and then get, talk about your creative idea. Listen. Americans will be paying less in taxes and keeping more of their own money to do what you want. You can save it, you can spend it, but it's all good for our country. We've lowered tax rates, nearly doubled the standard deduction, and doubled the child tax credit. Congressman, you wanted to vote for tax reform. You ultimately did not. Uh, tell us about what has happened since that vote. Well, of course, I wanted to. I want to vote for tax cuts. Unfortunately, in my state, because we the state and local tax deduction was gutted, uh, meaning that people can't deduct their property taxes and they're limited in what they can deduct in their state income taxes. Um, taxes are going up for people in Jersey. So obviously, I'm not going to support something where taxes go up. What we've suggested, Dan, as you brought and as you uh, suggested, is this concept where you can actually, so individual towns can actually allow people to make contributions, charitable contributions to the town, which they can deduct on their federal taxes, and those towns can give actual credits on people's property tax bills, actually giving them tax cuts <laughs> and dealing with the fact that they're now facing a tax increase from this bill, giving them relief. So you've, you came up with this idea, you don't need federal legislation, the towns can just go ahead and do this on their own? 
So I thought it was uh, an idea that we come up with, but actually 22 different states do a version of this. The IRS has ruled on this. Today, eight law professors who study tax came out and said what we propose is actually going to pass muster. So this is a great way without new legislation to use the tax code that's there, policies that have been used now for years and the IRS has ruled on and the 22 states do, including South Carolina and Alabama, and actually give people tax relief at home. So are there towns in New Jersey that are thinking about doing this? So last week we announced it actually with Paramus, New Jersey, and Park Ridge, and Fairlawn. Three mayors stood up and said, hey, I want to give tax cuts here to people in my town, and, you know, I want tax cuts too. So we got together and we figured it out, and they're going to try it in their towns. The state also, the governor-elect and the state senate president and the state budget chair, they all came out and said, we're behind this. We'll do whatever we need to do to actually give the towns power to give tax cuts to people. Okay, now, but would this screw up whatever the Republicans had finally settled on when it came to scoring of the bill and the amount of money that would be coming into the federal treasury if you take this route? Well, I, what I think they should do is actually take another look at what they've done, and hopefully this will force their hand. Instead of raising taxes on us, at, and as I've talked to you about, Dana, and giving some great benefit to these moocher states, these other states that take all of our money in the first place in Jersey, and maybe it'll give them a chance to actually relook at this and fix it. But right now, the IRS has ruled on this. 22 states do it, and we're going to take that tax cut in New Jersey. I think it's fascinating. You're a creative guy, and I appreciate you coming on to talk about it today. Thanks so much. Josh Thanks, Scott Dana. Hyper. Good to see you. As we are getting a look at the Senate testimony of Glenn Simpson, co-founder of Fusion GPS, that's the group behind that anti-Trump dossier. Senator Dianne Feinstein, ranking member on the Judiciary Committee, releasing the transcript moments ago. Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Herridge is live in Washington. Catherine, what are we learning from the transcript for as much as you've had a chance to review? Well, Dana, it's over 300 pages long, uh, but so far there are a number of very significant headlines. Uh, first and foremost, Glenn Simpson talks about two meetings that Christopher Steele, Christopher Steele is the former British spy who did the research for the dossier, meetings that Christopher Steele had with the FBI in July and September of 2016. And according to Simpson's testimony, Steele told him that the FBI had a source inside the Trump campaign, and this is one of the reasons they felt information in the dossier may be credible. And that section of the transcript from Simpson reads in part, they, the FBI, believed Chris's information might be credible because they had other intelligence that indicated the same thing. And one of those pieces of information, intelligence, was a human source from inside the Trump organization. So this is likely to be a question that will come up shortly at the White House briefing, Dana. Indeed. And why did Dianne Feinstein, the senator, say she released this? And was it in her authority to do so? Well, technically, it may not have been in her authority, but she certainly had the power to do it, which she did this afternoon. I think the key thing here is it shows this breakdown in trust between Senator Feinstein and the chairman of the committee, uh, Chuck Grassley. You'll remember at the end of last week, Senator Grassley and Senator Graham sent a criminal referral about the British spy Christopher Steele to the Justice Department. They want him to be investigated over allegations that he lied to federal investigators about how that dossier was distributed to the media. So we've got that development last week. And now this week, Senator Feinstein taking the very unusual step of unilaterally releasing this transcript and making it public about Glenn Simpson, who was behind the dossier, Dana. Fascinating. All right, Catherine, thanks so much. Appreciate it. You're welcome. It. Alex Azar, President Trump's pick for Health and Human Services Secretary, facing questions from the Senate Finance Committee at his confirmation hearing. Azar is a former top executive at Eli Lilly, telling senators that he thinks drug prices are too high. But some lawmakers are questioning his judgment while digging into his history at the pharmaceutical company. Nicole Petalides at the New York Stock Exchange. Nicole. Hey, Dana. Well, we're watching now. Alex Azar, very front and center. He's getting the questioning. And the question now for people on Wall Street and the people in his industry, because he's former executive of Eli Lilly, as you mentioned, whether or not he will really push for a change, a change from rising drug prices to ta tacking those back. Here's what President Trump tweeted. 
happy to announce, I am announcing Alex Azar to be the next uh, secretary. He will be a star for better health care and lower drug prices. So as, as the secretary here, will he in fact do that? We'll take a look at the drug price chart under Eli Lilly during the time that he was there. He joined Eli Lilly in 2009. By 2012, he was the president of Eli Lilly USA. And this particular drug jumped 95%. This is Umalog Quick Pen. So you can see that it has been on the move to the upside as the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Will he make some changes? The last thought I will leave you with is that people do like that he will be a friend to the industry. He knows the industry very well of drugs and the like. And of course, he knows the president. So will he bring everybody together and make it better for deal making? Dana? And he's almost certainly to be confirmed. Uh, Nicole, also it looks like it may be another record day on Wall Street. Can you tell me about that? Well, that I love to tell you about because everybody does well with their 401ks, their IRAs, their pensions. So a record all-time high again. The Dow went to 25,439, so a high today. As we look at the facts here, this today would be the fourth record close in 2018, the 92nd record close since Election Day. So we went from basically 18,000 and changed to this 25,000. Here are the names hitting all-time highs on the Dow. Microsoft, Caterpillar, Walmart, Boeing, Johnson & Johnson. The 10-year bond yield, the yield went higher. It's a 10-month high. Oil's above 63 bucks. And the whole idea is that we've had a stronger economy. We've passed the sweeping tax cuts. And people are feeling more optimistic. And it doesn't seem to be stopping. It's a mixed bag today for what's moving higher, what's moving lower. But the Dow's up 130. Overall, it's Dana. good. All right, Nicole Petalinis, thanks so much. Thank you. We are live at the White House awaiting the press briefing set to begin any moment now. Plus, the GOP changing its legislative agenda, what the party is focusing on. and can Stop Chantix and get help right away if you have any of these. Tell your health care provider if you've had depression or other mental health problems. Decrease alcohol use while taking Chantix. Use caution when driving or operating machinery. The most common side effect is nausea. I'm finally free of smoking. Ask your doctor if Chantix is right for you. Many insurance plans cover Chantix for a low or zero dollar copay. Hi, Shepard Smith on the Fox News deck, a live look at the White House where the briefing is set to begin any minute now, really in the next 15 seconds it's scheduled. This after we got an extraordinary look at the inner workings of the immigration debate between President Trump and both Republicans and Democrats. TV cameras stayed for nearly an hour as the president and lawmakers tried to reach a deal on the Dreamers, hundreds of thousands of immigrants whose parents brought them to the United States without documents. We'll hear what the White House says about that, why the president now says he'll sign it, and why he thinks earmarks are a good way to get things done. That's after the briefing on Shepard Smith reporting. We'll see you then. Capitol Hill now, where the GOP is scaling back its agenda, focusing on basics like funding the government, raising the debt limit, and striking a deal on immigration. Amid concerns the party won't be able to muster enough support to dismantle programs like Obamacare ahead of the midterms. Joining us now, Brian Streeter, the Director of Domestic Policy Studies at AEI. Midterm years are never necessarily easy um, for any legislative agenda for the majority. Uh, do you think that the Republicans have the right idea that they not try to do welfare reform going into this year? I think there's a way that they can actually do welfare reform. You're right, it's a, it's a controversial issue, and I think a lot of that has to do with the way they've set it up. Um, typically, when Republicans talk about welfare reform, they talk about getting people off of welfare. And uh, instead of talking about what they're trying to do about getting people into jobs, I mean, mm -hmm. welfare reform should really be about getting people attached to the labor force, getting them into better jobs, getting them into better job training so that they can experience you know, a step up in the American economy. That's what welfare reform should be about. And I think they could actually continue to make steps to make the social safety net mm -hmm. uh, the kind of uh, safety net that gets people into work, which, by, by the way, um, uh, not just in a, a majority of Americans, but a majority of people living in poverty think that the goal of our welfare system is to help people move into work and live independently. So if you had your druthers, what would you think would be a good domestic agenda going into this year? I mean, one of the things that the Republicans said coming out of that meeting that they had with President Trump at, the, at Camp David is that they know they need to do, continue to do the job of selling tax reform to the American public. 
they do need to continue to do that. They really haven't done that great of a job until now. But I do think that as the uh, economy continues to improve and the effects of the tax bill are felt uh, by households, I think that sales job gets even, even easier. Um, and look, I understand it's tough with the 60-vote threshold in the Senate to try to make progress on, on major reforms. Um, but it's been done in other countries. Uh, across the, the ocean in the United Kingdom, they've collapsed six welfare programs into one sliding scale benefit. And one of the results of that is they've seen um, people looking for uh, increases in people looking for work to the tune of 86 percent, where that just didn't happen in the, in the previous welfare program, which, which was more like the, the kind that we have. So I think a, a positive message about helping people who aren't working at the level that they want to be working at, not earning what they want to be earning, to have a, a reform program that, that actually helps people's lives improve is, is something that they could actually talk about. Um, although I, I have my doubts that that's what they're going to pursue this year, and they'll probably go for something a, a bit more modest. One of the things that President Trump did today, we've been talking about it all hours, he allowed the cameras to come in and, and basically record an entire discussion about immigration reform, a little bit also on, on the spending deal that they have to get to and when it comes to military readiness and making sure the troops have all that they need. Um, given that, do you think that there's a possibility that they could actually get something done? Unlike you know, yesterday, I, wanna, I won't play it necessarily, but yesterday Senator Schumer was on the floor of the Senate complaining that the White House often makes, uh, makes the deals too hard to get to at the end of the day. Felt like today the president was saying, okay, I think that actually we could do this and I think he will enjoy the good press that he's going to get because of it. That's a good point. I think there's a way to get some of these things done. The immigration case is a great, great example. I think one of the problems that, that members of Congress run into is trying to pursue immigration as a comprehensive package. Look, personally, I think comprehensive immigration reform makes a lot of sense for a lot of reasons, but trying to get everything done at once is, is really hard. And so in the current instance of trying to, 